Good day, everyone. Jeremy Simons back with your IBIS prep video series. Today, we're going to be talking about federal civil procedure MBE. And the first thing we're going to do is go through some outlines, and then we're going to get through some questions together and kind of see how these questions pop up and really what they are trying to get at and how to eliminate some to increase the percentage that you're going to get the correct answer, even on those that you may not be entirely 100% sure on. Now, remember where the federal procedure fits in in the whole scheme of things. Uh, during your process, you will have uh, on the MBE contracts towards some criminal law type of things. Your substantive law is your elements and your proof and when you get in front of a jury. Your evidence is what the jury is allowed to hear and your civil procedure is how you get to trial and how it's actually conducted. It is procedural. So all three of them go together, but this is the process in which papers are filed, which motions are had, uh, which courts rule on those procedural components. Evidence is a substantive issue. And of course, your other matters are substantive. So that's where this fits in. And the best way to look at your uh, federal civil procedure MBEs to figure out what stage of litigation they're in. That's the entirety of the civil procedure as it walks you through from the beginning, including jurisdiction, all the way through appeals. So it runs the entirety of your case. Let's jump in. These outlines are pretty, uh, they're in depth. There's a lot of depth to them. So we're, gonna, we're not gonna read them verbatim. Uh, we're just gonna go over them conceptually. And then of course, if you need to pause and read them or take notes or whatever the case is, just feel ready to pause and we'll also get these as we always do over to the drive. So our first issue that we're gonna deal with is subject matter jurisdiction. Subject matter jurisdiction, there we go. Okay, so subject matter jurisdiction, uh, sometimes uh, reduced to SMJ, um, which, by the way, pay attention because sometimes it notes they will uh, shorten motion for summary judgment as MSJ. So keep those two separate. Subject matter jurisdiction is whether the court has jurisdiction over the subject. That is the lawsuit or the dispute between the parties. It is entirely separate than personal jurisdiction. Personal jurisdiction being over the person or the corporation. For subject matter jurisdiction, we are specifically talking about those cases that end up in the federal courts. That's what this topic is about. So first we have to get into the federal courts and how do we do that? One area that we get into, there's four. Uh, the one that gets tested a lot is your federal question jurisdiction. Um, anything that's based on federal law, statutes, treaties, or the constitution is a federal question and the federal courts can always hear those regardless of the diversity or residences residency of the parties. Diversity jurisdiction is, it, it is a state law question. So we're not dealing with a federal question and you must have diversity between the parties. They must reside in different states. Otherwise you do not have diversity. And we're gonna see how this plays out a little bit deeper here uh, in just a minute. Um, but then you have your supplemental jurisdiction that kind of tags along with your main federal questions or your main diversity. And then you have removal jurisdiction, which is a uh, defendant trying to get a what was filed in state court into federal court. Um, and that's important. And removal is actually relatively uh, important and complicated. But what it does is it, it, it allows a defendant to avoid what may be perceived as an inherent bias on a state court that he doesn't reside in. For federal question jurisdiction, the question is whether the whether it the action, the cause of action, whatever it may be, arises out of federal jurisdiction or a federal question. So it arises under a federal law, treaty, statute, constitution when the complaint claims that it's based on federal law. It doesn't matter if the defendants defense is a defense based on a federal law. All that matters is the plaintiff really dictates what is a federal jurisdiction question versus a state court question. So it's the plaintiff's complaint. We look at the face of the complaint to determine 
whether it has a federal question. And this is your citation in case you remember it for any essays. The district courts have original jurisdiction of civil actions arising under the constitution laws or treaties of the United States. So your federal questions end up in your federal courts. Diversity jurisdiction is heavily tested and it's a lot of fun. Once you can kind of get the feel for how these uh, diversity jurisdiction questions go, you're gonna get all of them right. So di di diversity jurisdiction, uh, you need to ask a couple things. Number one, you have to have a threshold amount. You can't have a diversity action unless the alleged damage is exclusive of attorney's fees and costs. Your costs are your filing fees, your deposition fees, things like that. Um, as long as the underlying claim, uh, the controversy is $75,000, more than $75,000. And you need complete diversity. Now, there are a few exceptions. They're not really tested all that much. Just keep them. Uh, just keep them in the back of your mind that there are a few exceptions to complete diversity, but nine out of 10 times complete diversity is going to be the question on the MBE. So what is diversity jurisdiction? And I'm sorry, y'all, I keep touching my face. I, the allergies are out and it doesn't matter whether I film this tonight, tomorrow or next week, I'm still going to have them. So onward we go. My apologies. Uh, diversity jurisdiction, just, just write it out every time you see a diversity jurisdiction case. So let's look at the first one. The first one, we have John, Karen, and Susan who are suing Maverick. John, Karen, and Susan are two of them for, from New York and one is from Florida and Maverick is from Georgia. He's really not, I think he's from California. But um, in this particular circumstances, we have complete diversity of jurisdiction. Um, so the defendant and all the plaintiffs the plaintiffs have a complete diversity from the defendant, and that's the critical component of it. Um, had John, Karen, or Susan, for example, in the next question, John lives in New York, Sam in Florida, Andrew lives in Florida, and Michael lives in Georgia, who used to be Maverick, but we changed the name. Um, so because Andrew and Sam reside in the same state, you can't have diversity jurisdiction under this scenario, even though John and Michael do have it. So in your first in your first hypothetical, yes, we have diversity jurisdiction. In your second, no. Really just take your time with these diversity ones when you have some time before the bar exam and map them out. It makes it so much easier and you're going to be able to spot it and analyze it as you keep doing diversity questions. There are a ton of them. All right, so removal is another component that's relatively heavy tested because it falls really nicely inside the diversity in the federal question. It's a third nuance. And this is the next two slides are, I guess, are, are, are most in depth. So we're not going to go over all of it. Um, so on removal, this is, this is the defendant's opportunity to remove a case from state court to federal court. Now this is different then a transfer between two federal courts based on venue. And we're gonna see that in one of the questions that we deal with. Um, the defendants are the only ones that can remove out of state court. It makes sense because a plaintiff initially chose state court to bring the action. Uh, this, the plaintiff doesn't get to second guess where he or she or it uh, wants to bring, subsequently wants to bring that action. They could have chose state court, they could have chose federal court, they chose state court the defendant so long as we have either a federal question or diversity of jurisdiction can have the matter removed to a federal forum uh, again this is to avoid that concept of local bias um, we talked about this but it only proper to remove if it could have been brought in federal court anyway so this allows them to test not only your understanding of of federal question and diversity, but then to take on a third component of it. So really concentrate on these removal questions. They're easy pickings. Um, this is, again, the plaintiff's complaint is what rules all of this. If the defendant raises a federal question in a response, it does not mean that it needs to get removed. It arrives from the plaintiff. Um, so that's that's your removal. Concentrate on removal. They they like to test it. The Erie Doctrine is also one that they like to test because and it's a difficult concept because it 
concerns whether federal law or state law is going to apply. Now, clearly on a federal question in federal court, we're gonna use federal law, federal procedure. Um, so let's really talk about our, uh, state court cases, um, in a like I said, we're dealing with a diversity case. The, the in a diversity case based on state law, the, the court must apply the state substantive law. But if there is a federal law on point, then that that directly conflicts with the federal. I'm sorry, with the state law. Then you apply the federal law as long as it's valid. Um, federal rule of procedure is valid if it's procedural, and this is a component where we apply the state substantive law but the federal procedural laws apply in the federal court. So you could have a tort action or a breach of contract action in Florida based on perhaps Florida's corporate, um, Florida's corporate, corporate law. It's filed in federal court and let's assume it's fine. Um, but any type of, uh, let's say motion for summary judgment or the pleading timelines or the service of process, the 90 days at the federal level versus 120 in Florida, all of those federal rule of procedures are going to apply. This is also critical because remember when we did evidence, state substantive evidence rules will, no, federal evidence rules apply, your state law comes in on your substantive components of it. And I don't know if I'm making any sense on this, but remember that if it's brought under a state action under state law, even if there's diversity, state substantive law applies. That's how to win your case. Florida civil, federal civil procedure applies in order from the date of filing in order to move through jury and appeal, okay? Um, it's, 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 very, it's very common to test these and, and conceptually it's, somewhat difficult to kind of articulate it, but the best way to do it is anytime you get these questions on the Erie Doctrine, just read through them carefully because it, it kind of starts to mesh and make sense with how the flow goes. This, this component of it, this outline, um, I think is probably more complicated than just looking at the questions and reviewing them and seeing how, the, how they're generally structured. Um, Venue is clear, that's your choice of courthouse. That's different than your jurisdiction. Your jurisdiction is going to be, um, you know, federal court versus state court. Um, for venue, that determines which district court is appropriate. We already know it has to be in federal court. That's your jurisdictional component. Now the question is which one? That's your, um, that's your venue question. So local actions in almost any time we're dealing with land, um, it has to be adjudicated even in, even in your substantive law issues. Land issues must be adjudicated in the, in the district where that land resides. Um, courts can typically only take jurisdiction over real property if it's within their jurisdiction. Um, so then we have our transitory actions. Um, for federal questions, the plaintiff and the defendant have, for federal questions, it can be where all the defendants reside. Um, or if you have a diversity question, it can also be where one or all of the defendants reside, okay? Um, now the key on this is we look at the corporations, if we move down about halfway into the PowerPoint, you're going to see where humans are, they live where they live. That, that's the easy part. Look at the driver's license, uh, look at their utility bills. But corporations can have multiple homes. They can have their um, registered agent address. They can have a corporate address, a primary address. They can, it, for multi-state corporations, they're gonna have to have a registered agent and a primary place of business listed um, for every state that they're in. So your corporations, you need to really concentrate on whether that corporation is um, a resident, as the, as the phrase goes, of the state, because this can affect diversity jurisdiction. If you have a corporation that's a Del Delaware corporation, which is with its principal place of business in Florida, 
and a and there's a Florida action, and for whatever reason, that plaintiff really wants to get this into um, into federal court, and they allege that it's a Delaware corporation trying to create diversity that wouldn't work because that corporation is also a Florida uh, has a principal place of business in Florida, so. Um, that would not allow for diversity jurisdiction under those. Um, the transfer of venue, you're not gonna get a lot on those, but go ahead and just pause it and read it. Um, we're, we're gonna skip through that component of it. Uh, service of process and is, um, what you really need to know for service of process um, is that you can any non your your process server has to be an uninterested non party over the age of eighteen and he must and they will they they will uh, test you on this uh, that it you must uh, serve not only the summons but also the complaint so you can't just serve the complaint without the summons the summons is instructions on what to do with the complaint but if you only serve the summons then they don't know what they're getting sued for so service of process must have both of them you will see questions where it's only one or the other asking whether there's a valid service or process. Personal service is easy. You can serve a, a, a someone in person anywhere they may be, except if they are in a state, because one way to get personal jurisdiction is to serve somebody in the state that you, um, that you wanna sue them in. But if they're there essentially for um, legal purposes, um, then you you it's not valid service. So if somebody's showing up for a deposition or to appear at trial, something like that, the um, service process, you're not gonna be allowed to do that. But if they're at home or they're at work or they're getting at their airport or whatever the case may be, then you can serve them anywhere that you can find them. But that's not really the, the hard testing component of uh, service of process. The harder part is your substituted service and your service on a defendant's agent. Substitute a service, and we'll see this in Florida too, um, is where you go to somebody's home and the process server gets there and they're not home, but maybe their 17 year old kid is or their wife. And so what substitute service is, is it allows you to serve somebody else who resides with the defendant that you're having served. So long as they are of sufficient age to understand what's going on. Now, Florida has a hard line rule uh, on that age, but at federal, um, it needs to be left with a competent person who resides there, which is suitable age and discretion. Um, and then you have your service on corporations. So service on agents is valid so long as you serve them within a valid agency relationship. Um, I haven't seen a waiver by mail. I know it's, it's fun in law school to talk about waiver by mail. I haven't seen a question on it, but um, you can serve somebody by mail so long as they return a valid waiver within 30 days. So um, you can accept service, you can waive service, but all you're doing is waiving the service of process. You're not waiving any of your substantive claims. Um, okay, so we get to a complaint. We're going to go over the complaint real quick and probably better titled uh, pleadings. Um, federal level is an ultimate, uh, ultimate pleading jurisdiction. So you just need a short and plain statement uh, necessary to put the defendant on notice of what the action is about. Um, you must demand a judgment and you must allege the grounds in which the court has jurisdiction. Um, there are some uh, particular actions such as fraud, mistake, special damages. Um, that must be pled with particularity. You also see this uh, on affirmative defenses in Florida. Um, you, you're, here's your other pleadings, and people oftentimes will call a motion a pleading, and it's not. Th these are your pleadings. You have your complaint. That's what initiates an action. You have an answer. That's where the defendant answers agree or disagree. It's uh, admit or, or deny um, the allegations in the complaint. And then you have, oh, and I'm sorry, there should be another one in there that's called a reply. Um, you have affirmative defenses. That's, that says that even if everything in the complaint is true, uh, because of this defense, I win. 
Um, for example, let's say that there was a breach of contract action and the plaintiff alleges that the defendant didn't pay him a thousand dollars. And the defendant says true, but that's because they breached first. So that's your affirmative defenses. Affirmative defenses require a reply when they're dealing with substantive issues. Um, you have a counter complaint. Um, that's where a defendant then sues, uh, affirmatively sues the plaintiff. You have a cross complaint where there's two defendants and one of them sues the other, or they both sue each other. And you have a third party complaint and that's where you bring somebody in and you sue them. And then you can have third party counter complaints and all that. But a motion to strike, motion to dismiss, motion for summary judgment, those are not pleadings. So we have some special type of parties. We don't need to talk about plaintiffs and defendants uh, after your long haul in law school or, or if you're uh, switching jurisdictions, your long haul in litigation and, and practicing. Um, we're gonna assume that you know what a plaintiff and defendant are. So let's talk about some of the more uh, interesting ones. First one is you have these joinders. And so you have to join a party that's necessary and indispensable. If you don't, you could be subject to dismissal. They are absolutely necessary and indispensable for the full adjudication of the action. An impleter uh, is when a petition or complaint brought in a lawsuit by a plaintiff or defendant against a third party who may be liable to the plaintiff or defendant. So what you do is you have your normal plaintiff and defendant, and typically what a defendant will do is sue a third party and say, look, if I'm liable, this person's liable as well. So that is what you, that's where you implead and bring a third party into the action. An interpleader is, is interesting and they will test it, but not a lot. Conceptually, it's a lot of fun. So for example, let's say you have an escrow company on the closing of a house um, and both the, the buyer and the seller disagree, or let's say the two sellers because they're getting a divorce or something, disagree with how the escrow company, uh, company should distribute the funds. And so they say, you know what? They throw up their hands and they say, forget it. Y'all figure it out. They take the money, they file it with the clerk of court, and then they file an action called an interpleader where they say, judge, here's your money. Let these two figure it out. So that's an interpleader. An intervener or an intervention is a third party that actively seeks to be a part of the action for whatever reason. The pretrial resolutions, uh, these are your pretrial motions. They're tested not nearly as much as your jurisdiction or your diversity in federal question, but they will appear. Um, the, the motion depends on what stage you're at uh, to determine whether it's um, what the burden is. And I will tell you that the closer you move to trial and the more paperwork there is in the file, the easier it is for some of these dispositive motions to work. So a motion to dismiss is typically the first motion that gets filed and typically it's filed before even an answer or anything else. So what it says is it says, judge, you can take every fact of this complaint as true. And even if you do that, they cannot win. They failed to state a cause of action. There's an element that they can't meet. There's um, statute of limitations issues. Maybe it's a statute of fraud issues, whatever the case may be. But you say, judge, you, you take it all as true. We still win. You can only look at the four corners of the complaint and the court can do it either with prejudice. For example, you know, a statute of limitations issue that there's no way to cure it. There's nothing to go back and amend or you or they can uh, do with leave to amend, which gives you a second crack at it. Uh, motion for judgment on the pleadings. That's typically done when all the pleadings are closed. So you have your complaint. Let's say you have an answer and a counter petition. You have a reply and an answer to the counter petition. And then you have a cross claim, um, a cross claim between the defendants and you have answers and affirmative defenses between them with replies to it. So you can see how complicated it can get. But when the pleadings are done, you can look, you can ask the judge and say, judge, look at, look at the pleadings. If you read all the pleadings together, there's no way the plaintiff can win. Um, that's what a judgment on the pleadings is. The reason it's different than a motion to dismiss is because you can bring in additional pleadings other than just the motion, uh, other than just the complaint. So you're now looking at all the pleadings, which is why it's important to note that what a pleading is and what a motion is. And then you have a motion for summary judgment. 
The motion for summary judgment at the federal level and the state level of Florida are now exactly the same, by the way. Um, a motion for summary judgment, you can use affidavits. Um, you can you can use those types of things so you can go outside of the pleadings to a certain extent. And so what a motion for summary judgment says is, judge, taking the taking everything in the light most favorable to the non-moving party, um, that there's no genuine issues of material fact and a moving party is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. So you can provide supporting evidence, supporting affidavits. Let's say that it's a, um, let's say that it's a uh, um, uh, negligence case. And the question is whether the light was red or green. The plaintiff alleges it was red. The defendant alleges it was green. The defendant comes across a security video that clearly shows that it was his color. So he gets an affidavit from the uh, custodian of the camera on the date and time and submits the video along with the affidavit and there's no way to rebut it, no need to go to trial. Um, you can have a voluntary dismissal. Remember, it's a rule of one. So you can voluntary dismiss once without prejudice and it's not considered on the merits. If you file again and dismiss again, it is an adjudication on the merits. An involuntary dismissal is forced upon the plaintiff um, and it is considered an adjudication on the merits. Trial, trial is where we all try and get, where our clients never want us to get, but we're a trial attorney. It's what keeps us involved in this crazy area of, of professionals. Um, so you have a jury. Um, the jury is, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, you have to impanel a jury. And then you have a voir dire. That's how you can ask questions to a jury. You can also voir dire a witness to check the veracity. We do ideas of uh, expert witnesses under Daubert outside of the presence of the jury in order to establish whether they're actually um, considered an expert or not under Daubert. And Daubert, of course, is discussed in the evidence. They will, so you can get a motion for judgment as a matter of law, um, and you do that at trial at the close of evidence, and it's where reasonable minds could not disagree with the outcome as the evidence is presented. Um, the editor and remitter, remitted, you're going to see a difference between Florida and federal. At the federal level, when there's an editor, what happens, let's say a jury comes back with a, with a jury verdict of a million dollars. Um, an editor is where one party says, wait, wait, that's too low. The evidence, the evidence suggested that, uh, that I sustained $3 million in, um, in damages, Judge, I need you to add the remaining money. We already have the liability. At the federal level, an editor where the judgment is too low, a court cannot add more onto that judgment. It is considered unconstitutional. So there is, while the concept exists, you cannot get an editor um, at the federal level. A remitter means that the, uh, means that the, um, it was too high. So the million dollars goes against the evidence where perhaps they only proved a, a, a quarter million in damages. And so uh, they're asked for a remitter to make it less. Now, this is slightly different than an editor at the federal level. Uh, if it's too high, the uh, judge can suggest the amount um, and then the parties can accept it. If they choose, if they choose not to accept the remitter, then the court then must declare a new trial. So under either circumstance, the court cannot force uh, the change of a amount of a um, of a judgment. The only exception is under a remitter, where it's too low and both parties agree. You can move to set aside a judgment. These, but after you after you win that appellate time, you can only move to set it aside uh, up to one year, and that's only for newly discovered evidence, mistake or excusable neglect, or what we call Scrivener's errors or clerical errors. For example, the math just isn't correct. You can file a motion for new trials after the rendering of the verdict within 28 days. You must identify either errors in the law 
or the wrong application of existing law under case law or as it relates to jury instructions. Newly discovered evidence um, is evidence that existed before trial but could not have been discovered. Um, you can have misconduct. That's something that um, happened during the litigation that changed the outcome. Um, okay, so let's move on to appeals. That's our last area. You have an appeals as a matter of right. Those appeals you get if you lose, you get to appeal. Um, and that will go up to the uh, that'll go up to the appellate courts in Florida, of course, that's the 11th Circuit. I don't know why it used to be the Fifth Circuit. We're in the 11th. You have interlocutory appeals. Interlocutory appeals are very simply um, appeals during the pendency of the litigation. So it's it's maybe there's a, a, a contempt order or there's um, some type of um, order during the course of the litigation before you reach trial, you can uh, file an interlocutory appeal. And then there's also interlocutory appeal non followers. So let's get into some questions. Uh, let's see where we get. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to read these to you. That way we can keep the cadence and the pace. So the first one is a teacher brought a successful lawsuit against a charter school in state A, federal court. The judge successful must mean that she won. The judge found that the charter school had violated federal employment laws and awarded money damages to the teacher in the amount of $182,000. Excellent. The charter school appealed and then it lost the appeal. The federal rules of appellate procedure permit an appellate court to punish frivolous appeals by assessing extra costs. This is your rule 11. Under state A law, there's an automatic 15% penalty to an unsuccessful appeal of an award of money damages. Is the appellate court required to impose the 15% penalty? So the question is, 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 the, is the appellate court, is the 15% penalty substantive or procedural. Um, and so that's going to dictate whether we must apply state A's penalty provisions of an automatic 50% or whether we apply the federal rule of frivolous litigation and let it determine, if any, whether there's going to be um, any type of money damages as a result of the lost appeal. So are, are, is the appellate court required to impose a 15% penalty? Yes, because federal court is situated in state A, so state A's laws apply. So this is your state substantive. This would imply that the 15% penalty is substantive and must be applied. Remember, because we're in a diversity case. Um, no, we are not. We're in a federal question case. P, yes, because the penalty imposed by state law is substantive rather than procedural. Essentially kind of the same issue as A. No, because state A law conflicts with the federal rule, which prevails over inconsistent state law, or no, because only the federal rules of appellate procedure apply. Um, well, we can get rid of A and B. This is a procedural component. Um, and then, so we were ran into the question of C and D. And the question is, we're not, the reason C is incorrect is because we're not dealing with a conflict between federal law and state law. We're dealing with an issue of federal procedure, which gets us from point A of starting litigation to point Z of wrapping up an appeal versus substantive law of the state law court. So the answer is D, federal rule of appellate procedure applies. All right. A day before the applicable statutory, limitation, statutory limitations period expired, a worker filed a federal diversity action for defamation against her former employer, alleging that the employer had falsely and publicly accused her of stealing trade secrets. In describing the events that led to the false accusations, the complaint quoted a statement of a competitor made to the employer about the worker's alleged theft. During discovery, the worker deposed the competitor. One week after discovery closed, the worker moved to amend the complaint and add the competitor as a defendant. The competitor, the competitor opposed the motion on the ground that the statutory limitations had expired. Is the court likely going to grant the motion? So 
Remember that the worker filed it a day before the statute of limitations applied. So the question is, is whether the statement by the corporation, number one, relates back or number two, um, um, number two is whether there was reasonable means in which the plaintiff could have discovered the competitor's actions and then joined them in the suit prior to the statute of limitations expiring. Um, so we have four choices as we always do. A, no, because discovery has closed and the competitor will be prejudiced. That seems kind of like the judge probably has discretion on whether to determine whether to reopen discovery. No, because the amendment would not relate back and thus would be futile. C, yes, because leave to amend should be freely granted when the underlying action was timely. That's true. Um, that, is, that, is, that is a fair statement. Or D, yes, because the allegations against the competitor rise out of the same factual circumstances and relate back to the allegations in the original complaint. Um, the answer is B. The amendments would not relate back and thus would be futile. Um, because they won't relate back to add the competitor in when the competitor is simply going to defend on the issue of statute of limitations. Um, and we know it doesn't relate back or, or number two, that the plaintiff should, I'm sorry, that the, um, the former employer should have known about, I'm sorry, the worker should have known about the statements or the former employer should have known about the statements. Either one of them should have known about the statements prior to the filing. So unfortunately for this cause of action, the employer loses the ability to bring in the competitor because the statute of limitations has ran and because the competitor was well known at the initiation of it. And so this relate, it would not relate back and would be futile. All right, a man's wife filed a diversity action in state A, federal court, against a life insurance company to recover life insurance proceeds pursuant to the accidental death provision of her husband's life insurance policy. That's a lot of use of the word life. The evidence showed that the man was last seen on a business trip five years ago and has not been heard from since. His body was never recovered. Under state A law, the party seeking recovery under an accidental death policy is the burden of establishing the insured's death. The wife and the insurance company both filed motions for summary judgment based only on the evidence in the record, which means based only on the evidence that we read in this question, which party is likely to, pre to prevail on a motion for summary judgment. Summary judgment means that there's no dispute of material facts and that the moving party is entitled to judgment as a matter of law, we have four choices. The insurance company should win the motion for summary judgment because the wife has failed to provide sufficient evidence to meet her burden. The wife, because she produced sufficient evidence to meet her burden. The wife, because the insurance company has failed to produce sufficient evidence to meet its burden for neither party because the husband's death is a central issue of material fact that must be resolved during a trial by jury. That's So let's start at the bottom. Um, a material fact can be resolved as long as there's no dispute of that genuine material fact. So that makes D the wrong answer. Um, C is wrong because the insurance company doesn't have the burden. It's the wife's burden. B is wrong uh, because the wife just can't, she literally cannot prove that her husband is dead. He could be in Morocco. We have no idea. That means that A is correct because the wife has failed to meet her burden. She has to show that her husband is deceased under the terms of the life insurance policy. Therefore, the court will enter, grant the insurance company's motion for summary judgment. All right. The plaintiff filed an action in federal district court and served the defendant with the summons and complaint. The defendant moved to dismiss the complaint for failure to state a claim, failure to state a cause of action. Instead of opposing the motion to dismiss, the plaintiff dismissed the action and filed a new action. So remember, you're allowed to file once. It's not adjudication on the merits. I'm sorry, you're allowed to dismiss once, not adjudication on the merits, and you can refile. The defendant then moved to dismiss the second complaint, and again, the plaintiff voluntarily dismissed the second action, 
instead of filing opposition papers. The plaintiff then filed a third action alleging the same claims, but also including additional allegations that were responsive to the defendant's second motion. The defendant has moved to dismiss the third action. The plaintiff opposes the motion. Is the court likely to grant the defendant's motion? Now, first of all, this is just terrible practice. It, you, I mean, certainly there may be times when you need to dismiss based on some circumstances. Um, it's not germane here why I've done it. Um, but after your second one, just fight the motion to dismiss. So not only do you probably have a malpractice claim against the plaintiff's attorney, but the question is, is the court likely to grant the defendant's motion? This is a nice question because it's black letter law. The second voluntary dismissal acts as an adjudication on the merits because D is the only statement of black letter law that applies, um, then it's an adjudication on the merits and you can't refile. This one you just need to memorize. All right, let's go with the next question. A bakery incorporated and headquartered in state A had a dispute with a mill incorporated and headquartered in state B over the quality of the flour the mill had delivered to the bakery. So the bakery sued the mill in state A for breach of contract, federal court in state A, seeking $100,000. The contract between the bakery and the mill contained a clause designating state B court as the sole venue for litigating disputes arising under the contract. Under the precedent of the highest court in state A, and this is state court, Supreme Court, form selection clauses are unenforceable However, under the federal U.S. Supreme Court, form selection clauses are enforceable. The mill from state B has moved to transfer the case to a federal court in state B, citing the form selection clause in the party's contract and asserting the fact that the flour was produced in state B and the majority of likely witnesses are in state B. Is the court likely to grant the motion? So the question is, quite frankly, is whether the venue transfer that motion is procedural or substantive. Because we know that we have a substantive law in state A that if applies, renders the um, form selection clause invalid. So which one of this is where we get into, is it substantive law or is it procedural law? And the venue selection is covered in the procedural components of the federal rules a civil procedure, which means that D must be correct because federal law, because it's a procedural component, governs the transfer of venue. And under these particular set of facts, this is a form non-convenience. It would be more convenient for witnesses and parties to litigate the claim in state B. But what's more important is that state A's public policy on the enforcement of venue selection clause is invalid does not change the procedural component of being in the federal courts. Okay. A seller filed suit in federal district court against a buyer for breach contract, asserting that the buyer failed to pay the contracted price. The buyer argued that the seller did not substantially perform his portion of the contract because delivered did not meet the contractually agreed upon specifications. So the buyer was not obligated to pay the contract price. It's who breached first, classic contract litigation in question. At trial after the seller, in, seller put on minimal evidence and rested its case, the buyer moved for judgment as a matter of law, arguing that the seller failed to prove that its goods conformed to the contract specifications and that the buyer was therefore entitled to judgment on the breach of contract claim. So this is, this is at the halftime, right? So the plaintiff puts on his or her case, and then the defendant says, judge, they, they didn't meet their burden. The court denied the buyer's motion, which almost always happens. And then the buyer puts on his or her defense. The seller just sits back and watches. But the buyer didn't renew the motion for judgment as a matter of law at the close of its case. So then the case was submitted to the jury. The jury finds for the plaintiff. And then the buyer then moved for a new judgment as a matter of law. What is the court going to do with the buyer's renewed motion for judgment as a matter of law? Now, this one's hard. Is it going, is it going to grant the buyer's renewed motion? Yes, because the seller failed to meet his burden 
as the plaintiff to rebut the defendant's evidence at trial. Yes, because the evidence proves no reasonable jury could have entered a verdict in favor of the seller. No, because the court should abide by its earlier decision to deny the buyer's motion for judgment as a matter of law. No, because the buyer failed to renew its motion as a matter of law after the buyer put on this case in defense. This question comes down to an understanding. And, and so this is an elimination question. A has to get eliminated because it's not the defendant's burden. So A is gone. C um, just doesn't get to the point of the question. The point of the question is, do you have to renew a, a, a motion for judgment as a matter of law after your own after your own case, in addition to after the jury verdict? Black letter law says no. So that's why we get rid of D. That only leaves A, I'm sorry, B. Now, the question is actually very poorly writ written because as long minimal evidence doesn't mean that you don't meet your burden, but apparently what they're trying to tell us here is minimal evidence means that they did not meet the burden. So I, I don't know, but nevertheless, the point of the question is whether you must file a renewed motion for judgment as a matter of law at the end of, at the close of the defendant's evidence. And the answer is no. And then you just eliminate the other one so you can get to B, which is the best answer uh, on a poorly written question. Okay, so before filing a federal civil action against a seller, a buyer's attorney unsuccessfully tried to settle with the seller's attorney. Fair enough, happens all the time. Three days before the limitations period on the buyer's claim expired, buyer's attorney told the seller's attorney that she would file a complaint that day and asked the seller's attorney whether he would accept service of the summons and complaint. Fair enough, happens all the time. The seller's attorney agreed to, happens all the time as well. The buyer's attorney then files the complaint with the court, but forgot to serve the seller's attorney. So he's got a complaint and someone's sitting out and nobody's done anything with it. <coughs> so four months later, the buyer's attorney received a voicemail from the seller's attorney asking whether she ever filed the buyer's complaint because it was never served. The buyer's attorney immediately mailed a copy of the complaint to the seller's attorney. Then the seller's attorney a week later sought to dismiss the action to failure to affect time of service process. Is the court likely going to grant the seller's motion to dismiss? So this is a this is a tough question because what's at stake is huge. Because if the court dismisses the action for failure to properly serve uh, within the within the within the time period, which is 90 days, um, the statute of limitations is ran. So the action gets dismissed, and that means that the plaintiff's done. Their case wins or loses on this exact question. And this isn't unusual, uh, unfortunately. Um, so the question is, is the court likely to grant the seller's motion dismissed? Again, a lot at stake here. A, no, because under the federal rules of civil procedure, the filing of the complaint commences in action and the buyer's complaint was timely filed. Well, that's true, except we didn't have service process in time. No, because the seller's attorney had notice of the complaint and agreed to accept service. Well, that's true, except for you have to have service process within a specific amount of time. Yes, because the buyer's attorney did not show good cause for a failure to affect time of service. Or yes, because the limitations period expired without time of service. So D is wrong because as long as the complaint, as long as the complaint is commenced prior to the statute of limitations expiring. Then your, then your cause of action is timely. However, it, with, unless you show good cause, you have to serve a copy of the summons into the complaint, remember, um, within 90 days, that's the, that's the statutory time period on the federal law. If you don't do it and you don't have um, good cause, which essentially means excusable neglect, which means um, your paralegal sent it out to the process server, but the process server uh, forgot to serve it because he got in a car accident and was in the hospital for 89 days. That's excusable neglect. Um, the plaintiff's attorney filing the lawsuit and saying, oops, I forgot to send it over. Um, that's malpractice, which is not excusable neglect. So we wish uh, the plaintiff's attorney luck and the malpractice action that he or she is going to face, probably for a lot of money. 
But as far as the question is concerned, the answer is C, there is no good cause and therefore the matter will be dismissed. All right, so a record label sued 10 disc jockeys in a single suit in federal court alleging that the violation of federal law, so we have a federal question, the disc jockeys pirated music that the record label sought to distribute in exchange for payment. I remember these programs when I was in law school. I don't think we have these anymore. We were still buying stuff off CDs. The disc jockeys did not know one another and did not communicate with one another when they engaged in alleged piracy over a six month period. So we have these random disc jockeys from all over the place uh, who independently apparently pirate all of these, all this music. Uh, they have to play it on the air because they're disc jockeys. How else did they get caught? Um, each disc jockey took the position that he or she was a first time violator, which matters here in a minute. The disc jockeys moved to sever the record label suit for improper joinder because the record label sued all 10 disc jockeys and they're saying that they don't have any um, connectivity to each other. So as well as to dismiss for failure to state a claim on which relief can be granted. In support of their motion for failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, the disc jockeys argued for an interpretation of the relevant federal law that accepted first time violators from liability. And that's what each one of them is saying. The first time violators, federal law says, um, because I'm a violator, I, I understand I, it's, you know, I, I can't do it again, but you can't sue me for damages because that's what federal law says. So should the court grant the disc jockeys motion to sever for misjoinder? And remember, there's also a motion to dismiss. So the question is, what do we do with that? Should it court grant the Dostrovsky's motion to sever misjoint? Yes, because there is no question of law or fact that is common to all disjockeys in this lawsuit. Well, there is a question of law that's similar. The question of fact is, we don't really see that. We don't know, they didn't act in concert. We don't know which songs they downloaded. Um, they certainly weren't in cahoots with each other. Yes, because the record label failed to assert a right to relief arising out of the same transaction, occurrence or series of transactions or occurrences. No, because the record label is alleging that the disc jockey is engaged in piracy during the same time period. So the claim arises out of the same transaction, which quite frankly, just logically makes no sense. No, because the appropriate action is for court to postpone a ruling on the motion to sever until it decides the motion to dismiss. Quite frankly, I like D. I really like D because I think that would, I think from a, litigation perspective, if there is in fact this, this first time violator law, the protective federal law, um, I, I think if I were the defense attorney, I would have gone straight to that because it gets rid of the case entirely. And that's the most cost effective way to do it. But the answer is yes, because the record label failed to assert a right. So they, so they had a pleading problem. They didn't plea properly that all of this arose out of the same transaction or occurrence, just that um, there's 10 disc jockeys that exist. So yes, the court would grant the motion to sever. But again, the, I think the better practice would be to go straight after the second one. Um, but that's, that's just me. A small commercial airplane crashed in state A. The passengers and pilot, all citizens of state B were killed in the crash. The airline that owned and operated the airplane is incorporated and has maintenance facilities and principal places of business in state C. One day before the statute of limitations on their claims would have run, the estates of the pilot and each of the passengers filed a wrongful death action against the airline in federal court in state A. The airline was served one week later, so we have no service process fee and wants to prevent the state A federal court from hearing the action. So this is a which one's best. Which of the following motions is likely going to accomplish airline's goal? A motion to dismiss the action for improper venue. Well, that's not really going to solve the problem um it's a venue it's not a it, it is a venue question but it's not a jurisdictional question uh, a motion dismissed the action for lack of personal jurisdiction um the crash so the event occurred in state a so there isn't any, any reason why the state a federal court can't take jurisdiction um a motion to dismiss the action of the doctrine of forum non-convenience that's interesting because you have state B where the passengers all lived and their witnesses, state C is where the pilot was, but the actual crash and evidence is in state C. So 
that, that, that would be a judgment call and judgment calls don't make good answers on multiple choice questions or a motion to transfer the action to federal court and state seat. The answer is D, it's the only action, it's the only component that a lot that makes sense. You can't file a motion to dismiss the action for improper venue. It should be a motion to transfer the action for improper venue because you're not saying that they're necessarily not entitled to um, damages or that the cause of action can't be independent. You just don't like the court in which it sits. Um, again, this inherent bias component of it, but you so uh, I appreciate everybody um, watching this video, all of you. I'm sure. Uh, you were either taking diligent notes or you may have used this as part of your sleeping regimen. Either way, Ibis Prep is very thankful. Uh, we will also have a uh, Florida uh, Florida Civil Procedure course. Uh, that, that video, I'll be wearing the exact same outfit. Um, and if you need individual tutoring, that's one thing that takes Ibis Prep and sets it apart from its competitors is our ability to individually work with each one of the students so we can concentrate on exactly those components that they may be struggling in in order to Im drastically improve those uh, matters on the bar examination. So with that, I appreciate it and we'll see you in the next video.